call them in a time like this when hell is set loose say the kingdom of God still stands how many believers still stand come on shout a big hallelujah speak as you have never spoken God God let your people hear you God and acknowledge the Lord Almighty Jesus Christ our Savior oh my God let us respond give us a responsive spirit that we may say amen to your will and to your way have thine own way tonight Father you understand what's happening what's going around the attack of the enemy but God you know you set me forth to stand with my face like a flint never to be moved in the name of Jesus Christ have thine own way we glorify you now we honor you we give you every praise somebody who believe God say in Jesus name amen you may be seated in the presence of the Lord grace mercy and peace from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to the household of faith my father's children I greet you in the matchless and the magnanimous name of Jesus amen thanking God tonight to be back in the house of the Lord amen to look at the book of Psalms amen and we still have to finish the introduction tonight it's a more technical and more detail oriented introduction or part portion of the introduction that I think is pertinent for the people of God to know as we go forth into the depth and the breadth and the height and the width of knowing who Jesus is. But before I get into the Psalms, I want to say something to the household of faith. It doesn't matter who may disagree with what I stand for. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to change. It doesn't matter if you think I'm hard or soft. It doesn't matter if you think that I don't want something or I want something. I'm not going to change. Who God made me is who I am. People like me don't come out of the war. We die in it. I'm not going to change for nobody. Nobody's ever going to make me change. I'm going to serve God until the day he calls me home. I'm going to stand, I'm going to shout the name of Jesus. I'm going to call wrong, wrong. And I'm going to call right, right. And sometime when I come down your street, you too might not come back to church. But I'm still going to say, it's still right. And when it comes to holiness, it is still God's request. And it's still God's requirement. And holiness comes down your street and turns your life upside down. But it's still holy. And I'm not going to change for anybody. Not for money, not for pleasure, not for fame, not for notoriety. I'm still going to cry, holy. And if you're with me, shout holy. Whether you shout it or not, it's God is still a holy God. And he should be praised. Amen. Amen. The book of Psalms, I, I think people are foolish not to be in the house of God to hear God's word. For people who are not apt to learn and to grow will continue making the same mistakes. When higher calling is summoned by God, the people of God must be ready to hear and have to learn and ready to go to a higher level. We got to stop the regurgitation of the same last generation's revelation because God reveals himself generationally. And if you are okay being stuck in five generations ago, then you are making no progress as to what God requires for your personal life. And your life matters in the kingdom. Your lives matter. Your life matter. Your life matter. Our lives matter in the production and the, the continuity of what God is doing in, in 
of the world and to extrapolate out of the Gentiles a people for his name. Your job is not to preach to Jews. Your job is to preach to the world this great salvation. But if you're stuck in what you think you know, you can never preach to a millennial. You can never preach to a millennial because the millennial is more smarter than you are. They know every aspect of, they're so well learned, the millennial. You can't come with a five million years ago doxology. They'll tell you your God is dated. And God cannot be dated. God is always relevant. He's a relevant God. But you got to know how God is speaking to a generation. To a people. You got to know how God is dealing with people. In this hour that you live. If you can't preach in this generation. Ask God to take you home. Because you have no use and purpose. Because you got to know how to preach to a generation that's there. God rose up prophets to speak to that generation. God rose up preachers to preach to a generation. And if you're fed up of the generation that you're in, tell God to take you. But as long as you live, and as long as you are in this church, you should ever desire to go higher. Deeper yet, I pray. And higher every day. Oh, that I may know you. Oh, that you may reveal to me what I need to know for this generation. Psalms has, in our continuity of what we're saying, it has a monotheistic theme. And all that we said last week, I will not recapitulate, I will not regurgitate, I will just go forward so we can finish the introduction so we can get into the Psalms. But Psalms has a monotheistic theme. It, it, it's a story about in the songs and in the hymn and in the history and in the prayer. It, 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 it summarizes as a story of a God and his chosen people. A God who elected a people. He chose them. He elected them. And then he covenanted them. So when the psalmist is either writing a song, a prayer, history whatever he's doing he has in mind that he is an elect of God you're not hearing me no you did not get it so it, the psalmist is writing with the knowledge that he's an elect help us Lord He's writing knowing that God chose him, his people, as an elect, as a called out, and a covenant, a covenant to people. So when he's writing unto God, he's writing with this persuasion. And you know there are multiple authors, but you understand as I go along. He's writing with this mindset that I got a covenant with God. So when I'm pouring out, I'm pouring out from a position of election. Not pouring out from a position of a dog and a sorcerer or an alien or a stranger as the Gentiles were. But the psalmist is pouring out as an elect. It's a different kind of pouring out. When you can pour out with confidence as opposed to pouring out with uncertainties. I'm all by myself. 
as the elect people, it's, it's the story of a, the one true God who chose a people for himself. And then he bound himself to them by his covenant. And this covenant ex expressed God's intention to save his people. And that through them, he would save the rest of the world. So there's a covenant this God chose these people and said, I'm going to save you. But I'm also going to empower you. That you may save others. So at no point should you have a theme that I'm saved and stop or full stop. The theme should always be I'm saved so that God can use me to save somebody else. Lord help us tonight. But God elected them and he, sh he said I'm going to save them but he said you got in order for me to use you in an appropriate way I've got to make a covenant with you and the reason why God makes covenant with man is because man has the propensity the innate propensity to do that which pleases himself that's why somebody can say amen with you for a while, but when you're not, when you correct them or put them in their place, they don't, they say we're out. Because you always want to do what you, as a matter of fact, a lot of people, I won't put a percentage of I felt like doing it. A lot of people are not serving God because God has them under control. They're serving God because they're using God. Because they know God has assets. They know that God has possession and assets. Eyes have not seen nor ears have ever heard. I was looking today at some of the richest people. The Rothschild with $4 trillion just to one. Or the two of the family member, $4 trillion. You talk about the richest people in the world. You talk about Bill Gates. Those guys are poor. The Rothschild has $4 trillion. You don't talk about those guys because they're not worth, money is not a, 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 even an afterthought. So you don't put them in the richest people in the world because you embarrass them to do that. They're worth four trillion. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So they have assets, so, so when you see those kind of people, you kind of draw close to them. So you can have from the great wealth that they possess. And that's how we serve God. We serve God because we're looking for something from God. But the minute God says no, scamper off. We came with ulterior motive. So God says, I'm, I've elected you, but you got to make a covenant with me. If you would do what I ask, then I will. Mm -hmm. So God made a covenant with people. Uh, God offered grace. I'll, I'll forgive you of your sin. Huh? I, 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 I'm going to take your life and I'm going to make your life a reflection of my glory. God began to offer things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use you as a light to the Gentiles. But in return, you got to Resist the sin. Resist the other voices. Say no to the thing that you so desire. And to the people you so love. And so the thing that you have been going after. You got to say no to it. Because when you are the light of the world. You are reflecting God. And he said to Israel. You are my people. You are my witnesses. Said God that I am he. There's none beside me. But if you're going to be my weakness. You can't walk around in light with sin. Adam couldn't dwell in the garden. Because oh Lord. You can't have sin. And have eternal life. 
You can't say you represent me but be a sinner. Lord, I'm not. People have to acknowledge that they have to walk right. You want God to forgive you, you got to walk right. You want God to elevate you out of your position, you got to live right. You want God to hear you when you cry, you got to walk circumspectly. Oh my God. You can't walk lean and expect God to bless you. You can't have, be crooked and expect God to be by your side. Lord, you can't have your own way and expect God to talk to you. Why would I talk to you when you're intending to do your own thing? Oh, I can't deal with you. If I'm going to covenant with you, you got to love me. And you got to love each other. You got to be an example to each other. You got to strengthen each other. As I have strengthened you. Oh God. Oh, again, the people understood when they accepted the covenant of God that the well-being, the well-being of, of the people were predicated on his brother. So in order for me to survive, you got to survive. In order for you to survive, I got to survive. Each member had to care for each other. That's why we have the church. Come to the church. You don't come to the church for yourself. You come to the church yet to be strengthened, but while you're strengthened, you got to strengthen somebody else. That's a part of the covenant with God. Each one shares each other's joy. Each one shares each other's sorrow. Can't share my joy or my sorrow. You have no covenant with God. If you can't be elated for me when things are going well with me, you have no covenant with God. If you can't cry when I'm hurting, you have no covenant with God. You got to share my sorrow. You got to share my grief. But you also got to share my happiness. In this, in this monotheistic kind of movement, the people understood something. That as an elect of God, in my time of trouble, I, I don't complain. I, I don't seek revenge. I don't seek retribution. I don't, uh, what I do is I pray. I gather the people. I sing some songs. Oh, Lord, I'm on. I, I recite what God words, the promises of God. We sing the song, sang the song, standing on the promises of Christ, my Savior. Standing on the promises of Christ our Lord. We, 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 we you to go back and reflect on those words. So they would go back to their history. The history of God's covenant with them. And they would reflect on it. And they would, they would talk to God about it. And they would sing songs about it. And they would encourage themselves. That's why David came on and said, soul, soul, why art thou disquieted in me? Don't you hope in God? Don't you remember what God said? Don't you remember what God said? Haven't you remember what God said to you? Don't you remember? Why, why are you weeping? Why are you hanging your harps? Why are you murmuring? Why are you complaining? Don't you, why are you worried? Don't you remember what God said? We have selective memory. We have selective, we only remember the things we want to remember. And when you're covenant with God, your confidence is locked in with him. And you know that some way, somehow, God is going to make a way. Come on, touch somebody quietly and say, I know the Lord will make a way. Come on, touch somebody else and say, I know the Lord will make a way. He's going to make a way. He's going to make a way. He's going to come on, open up your mouth and say, he's going to make a way. He's going to make a way. He's going, he promises that I'll never leave you. You may not have Israel's, Israel's covenant, but you got the church's covenant. 
And he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Why are you moaning? Why are you complaining? Even when things are dark, why are you quitting? Don't quit. You can cry to God. You can complain. But you can't give up. It's okay to cast your burden on the Lord. But don't cast it and quit. Cast it and be strong. He alleviates the burden. So the weight's gone. So now you can praise him some more. Cast your burden on the Lord. Listen, it ain't always going to be easy. But weeping may endure for a night. But joy's on the way. Come on, tell somebody joy is on the way. And the joy might not be the elation that you may think is good. The actual joy might make you cry. Because, because, because the man you think you should have, you may not get it. And the woman you may think you have, you may not get it. But you better leave for joy. The job you apply for, you may not get it. But God has something else for you. Amen. God has another job for you. Y'all ain't saying nothing tonight. God has something else for you. Amen. Rejoice. When they say you didn't get the job. Rejoice. Joy has come in the morning. You went all night worried about, did I get the job? Did I get the job? And you all nervous. And next day you go to say, no, you didn't get it. And you're hanging your head. Don't hang your head. Rejoice that you didn't get it. There's a reason why you didn't get the job. You would have been sexually molested. You'd have been attacked. You'd have been bruised. You'd have been beaten down. You'd have been... Uh, Thank God you didn't get the job. You'd have been so stressed out that you lose your hair. You wouldn't be able to worship Jesus. Joy came in the morning. Somebody shout joy. Joy came in the morning. The joy that God caused you to escape the wrath of Satan, the traps of Satan, the snare of Satan. Oh Lord, Satan could have eaten you up, you could have been destroyed, but God stopped it. He stopped the mouth of the lion. He didn't get to bite you where he wanted to bite you. Oh God. And God said, No, you walk, you should walk out saying hallelujah anyhow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah anyhow. Glory anyhow. Thank you Jesus anyhow. But we spend too much time weeping over the things that we didn't get. Not because you cry to God but you think you're going to get it. He knows what you need. He knows what you need. He knows that he can't give the sparrow a mansion. The sparrow has wings. <clears throat> and the sparrow needs to fly. Mm, oh, the sparrow is not a static creature. Huh? Talk to me a little. And he give a slot. He give a slot a place to hide. Because the slot don't move too much. God knows what you need. Come on, do you believe the God you serve? Do you believe Jesus? He knows what you need at the time and when you need it, when it's most important, when it's not important. He knows what you need before you ask and the way is already provided. It's already done. So the writer of, writers of the Psalms, they understood this. They understood this. So different people wrote different things. God. I told you last week that sometimes in, when it comes to God, you, might, you may write. When the writers were writing, they poured out grief. They poured out sadness. They lamented like a, like a mother laments for her child. They poured, they poured it on God, but I want this to be clear to you tonight. 
They didn't pour it on God because they did not think God cannot do it. They poured it on God because they're saying, why haven't you done it already? There is a staunch difference in crying about something to someone who you think cannot do it versus crying to the person who you think, why haven't you done it? So when the psalmist, they write sometimes, they are lamenting unto God. Because Lord, why haven't you done it? And, and the psalms, it can be identified to, to a multiplicity of, of categories. Let's look at some categories from the psalms. You could, as before mentioned, the psalmist some wrote, and in their writing, you could hear the lament. They were lamenting. They were crying to God. And when they were crying, it laid a troubled situation before God, asking for God's help. They laid it out for God, and they're saying, God, I need you to intervene. I need you to get involved in this. And, and, and the psalmist, as I said, is not only writing about himself, it might be, he might be writing about the, commu the situation of the community. So the situation of the community might be problematic as it, were, as it is in Psalms 12. The situation might be problematic. And so the psalmist cries out to God. Listen, we have a situation here that needs your help. Or the psalmist could be crying to God as it is in Psalms 13. And he might be saying, Lord, I need your personal intervention for my life. And so he's crying. But notice that he's not taking it on himself. The community is not taking it on themselves. Because let me, let me illuminate you for a minute. You can do nothing of yourself. Can I even go deeper? You can't fight the things you can't see. You can't fight the devil. I know you all think you're big and bad and so I don't need nobody. I can talk to God myself. You are going to hell. Because the devil is going to get you to do things that's going to send you to hell. You can't fight devils. You don't have the authority to fight devils if you don't have God. So, so, so when, so, and thank you, because sometimes we just, so in, not because you know how to say in the name of Jesus. That means the devil is going to go running from you. Let, let me illuminate you. When you say in the name of Jesus, say that I rebuke in the name of Jesus, what you don't see is the big dog, dark, tall fella that shows up in front of Satan. That big old fighting war angel that intervenes on your behalf. That's what you don't see. That's somebody that's in Christ. But when you're not in Christ and you saw in the name of Jesus, he'll tell you, Paul, I know. And Jesus, I know. But how dare you use the name of Jesus if you don't know him? Some of you think you know Jesus because you're baptized and you bite your tongue every week. But your attitude is an indicator that you don't know him. When you call on him, you have no defense. You wonder why every time you, somebody slap you, the slap actually hits your face. And tears you down because, you, but I rebuke in the name of Jesus. You get another slap. And another one and another one. Because you, your, your life is not holy. Your life is not in relationship with God. There's no communication with God. No, the, the communication with God is severed or never was ever conjured up. But when you know him, you can cry to him and lay out your troubles. 
One writer said, I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. I dare not carry or deal with these burdens alone. In my distress, he will kindly help me. I don't got to force him to help me. I just got to call on him. Lord, I wish I had some help. Huh? Kindly help me. When you know him and you call on him, he's always ready to answer your prayer. Find that this category of crying in the psalm, it, it occupies a large portion of it. It, it. it almost takes up a third of the psalms. Crying to God for help. Crying to God. It would seem as though, or it would seem paradoxical that the psalmist is always crying for help. But, but it's, it's actually a good thing. Because it speaks to dependence. That means the, the, the psalmist and, their, and, and they are multiple. They, they, at no point throughout this thousands of years and different writers, at no point because of the covenant with this one God and an elected people. They always had the, the, the understanding that no matter the generation, no matter the age, no matter the time and the season, they can always call on God. They could always cry about their perplexities and their trials and the enemy being upon them and, and, and how hated they are and how much they feel like they, they can't handle the situation. Lord, you have to help. They're coming from a position of the elect. Coming from a position of being chosen. So their confidence is not like an average man's confidence. Through generation after generation, you're told that God is in your corner. You're told that God has chosen you. You have not chosen him, but he has chosen you. So no matter, not because you're chosen, that means you won't have trials. As a matter of fact, because you're chosen. That's why hell is set loose. But the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. Still said. The next kind of psalm we have a hymn of praise, which call God's people to admire his great attributes and deeds. Psalms 8 and 93 and 147. You see these kinds of praise. You see God's attributes. But you really can't see God's attribute until after the cloudless rain or the storm has passed. See that God, how mighty his hands are. That's why people write in these metaphorical terms. He's mighty to save. His hands are stretched out wide. These metaphorical, and God doesn't have hands like you and I have hands. But metaphorically, his hands are stretched out. He's mighty. He's a buckler. He's a shield. God is not a shield. All these, 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 these metaphorical uh, depiction of God about how great and how mighty and how strong the, the right hand of God, how strong he is. We talk about how, how awesome he is. And they sing praises. Oh, God. Jehovah, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all. Awesome. You're radiant. You're worthy to be praised. Come on, people of God. Don't you got something to think about in your mind's eye how awesome God is? How great, how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. Why are you singing it? Because it sounds good? No. Stop singing these songs because it sounds good. It has to have a meaning. It must be true to your situation. It must be true to your revelation. Israel and the new breed singing, they, they ain't singing about no revelation. They're singing songs. But when you talk to God, you're worshiping. Saying, God, you are mighty to sing. You're awesome. Oh, my God. 
You dwell on the circle of the earth. Hey! I wish I had somebody who would so try. I need some people who love God. Open up your mouth and praise him. Gotta praise God. Your praise. You got to have a praise. You got to have a praise. When God pulled you out of a situation, you, you just. You can't just let it go like that. You can't just. The enemy, want, the, the enemy should be tired of hearing you praise. If it were not for the Lord who were by my side, where would I be? a praise and it got to mean something to you come to church and we cry and sing about other people's experiences come and talk all the time you talk about Paul and you talk about Silas but you ain't talking about you mean you have no experience with God doesn't mean you have no experience with God. You got to have your own reason to worship. You got to have your own reason to praise. You got to have your own experiences. You know why people don't have an experience with God? Because you ain't praying, you ain't talking to him enough. When you talk to God enough, it attracts hell. Get up! Talk to God enough, you wouldn't be so dry. Them that love God and seek God are always going through something, so they gotta always cry to God and always end up praising God for the deliverance. Jesus is my deliverer. Jesus is my deliverer. How do you know He delivered? I know because you see stop singing you got to have the in your mind how did he deliver you how did he deliver you yesterday on the highway I could have been a dead preacher you could have been coming to my funeral but he delivered me so I can sing it with assurance Jesus is my My experience with God. By the way, I almost died, but I still came to church. Preach the devil out of the chairs. Talk to me a little. Deliverer. Psalmist, he understood me. Lord, I wish I. Lord, I. I Really, I talk to God. I really do. I said, Lord, I sometimes I don't want to do this. Because the way I feel about God, I don't think the people feel the same. But it's not my place to say this. But I tell God, I don't this 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 fire that I feel. I don't see it. I don't see it, God. This this fire am I am why I'm burning up. And I don't see it. So Lord, I'm wasting my time. Don't people know that if you were not for the Lord, you would not be here tonight? How can you hobnob and sleep on God? Psalmist didn't do it. They praise him. For his great attributes and his deeds. For his mighty works that he performed. They praised him. And when he pulled them out of something, they praised him. When Peter realized that he was about to die. And we were, before he knew it, he was being led out by an angel. He couldn't believe it. He ran back to the people and they began to praise this is this can't be nothing else but the hand of God. Oh my God. 
no man could do this. No lawyer could. I know you love running to your little Jewish lawyer. But no Jewish lawyer can do this. This has to be the hand of God. How did I get here? How did I get delivered? It has to be the hand of God. How did I get pulled out of this fire? It has to be the hand of God. How is it that I'm not dead by the way? Sir? It had to be the. How is it that I'm not tore up? It had to be the. It had to be the hand of God. If the hand of God has done it for you. You got to have a praise. You got to always have a praise. I got to be always saying, settle down, settle down. Because you always got to praise. You always got a thanksgiving. You said, when I close my eyes, Pastor, I can't stop thinking about the goodness of Jesus. And all he has done for me. I know you want me to be quiet, but inside my soul cries out, hallelujah. Oh, you like real life. The Psalms are like real life scenarios. They're ancient, but they're still contemporary. When you look at them and see why they're praising God, you just have to take a glimpse at your own life and see what He has done for you and what He's doing for you and what He's about to do for you. you gotta have a praise. Another type of Psalms is Psalms of Thanksgiving. The community, Psalms 9, thanked God. And Psalms 30, the individual, is thanksgiving. Thanking him. Thanking him. One of our greatest problems is that we're not grateful. We're not grateful for the move and the things of God. We, we, we have this expectation we walk around and, and there's nothing more ugly than to see Christian walk around with the spirit of entitlement as if to say because I serve God I'm, I'm so great and, and whatever he needs I need he supplies walk around sense of entitlement and we don't praise God we're not thankful got to be thankful I was, the writer said be thankful and bless his name for he is good Jesus it's good the fact that his mercy is Endure it forever. Good. God don't say excellent because good is good enough. Because we are so entitled, we don't like good. We want to go beyond God, but God said it's good. Gotta be thankful. Another guy, another. Uh, another category is we got to, the psalmist celebrated the law of God. Psalms 1 celebrated the law of God. Here's where we have a problem. Because to celebrate the law of God is to accept what's in God and to do. In order to celebrate it, it's not so much in words, but in that you have accepted it in your heart and you have applied it in your life. So when you have accepted the word of God in your heart and applied it in your life, you will see the results of it. The reason why we have not been successful in our church is and not only, I'm not talking about WLA, I'm talking about the church. The reason why we don't see success and that we have now gone to ulterior or alternative is a better word, alternative measures is because we have not 
completely and truly and sincerely accepted God's word in our hearts and applied it to our lives. Because it's a process because you are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And when the word of God comes, it comes to tear up and burn out and tear down and break down and grind to powder the desires of your human nature and, and natural intuitions. And it builds up and builds a new foundation of God's expectation and his word in your life. And it builds it up in your heart and now it must be applied to your life. Once it apply, it's applied to your life, then you start walking in the ways of the Lord. And your life then become pleasing in his sight. And once your life becomes pleasing in his sight, then you see the manifestation of the glory of his word. Because whatever God said has to come to pass. Talk to me a little bit. Because the, his word is a light and a lamp. So, so it's shining. So every step you take, it's an illuminated way. Because it's by the word of God. And so you can testify that the enemy has no nothing on you. The enemy has no hold on you. The enemy cannot bind you. The enemy cannot say, no, because you're walking in the way of God. When you're walking in the way of God, you must find success. It's, it's mandatory. God has never failed once. So when men and women have gone through and have accepted the word of God in their hearts and applied it to their life as did they, they, the law, you find that they had success. What are you talking about? As a community, you find that when the enemy came in like a flood, the Philistine came in. Oh, when any nation, the Hittite, the Perizzites, the, the Hutites, any type that came in to fight against the people of God, when Balaam tried to curse them and Balaam hired him to do it, no matter what, when you're walking according to the word of God, it's in your heart and, and, and you live it in your life, no devil can stop you. Because God will fight your battle. So because they lived that experience, they, they sang a song unto God, celebrating it. When you are the elect of God, as I aforementioned, when you are the elect of God, being an elect of God doesn't mean that it comes with, with just being an elect. It comes with responsibility, yes, but it also comes with protection. It comes with guide, a guide. It comes with an encampment. It comes with a leading, comes with a light. So the word of God comes with, 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 with ammunition, so to speak. So when you're an elect, that means you're, understand the word elect. Election means that you are a, appointed. And at no point can anybody take away your election. If God has elected you, you cannot be unelected. Sometimes I feel like I'm going to fall out of the way. No, no. That's foolish talk. If you are an elect of God, no devil can change you. I don't care what they say about you. Your face looks like a starfish. I don't care what they say. You are an elect of God. And when you're an elect, who can touch or stop the elect of God? Who can hinder the elect of God? That's why the elect praise God for his law and his word. I know the word of God is not easy to apply to your life. Some of the things that he's asking you to do, you just feel so, you know, the trepidation of having to deal with the heaviness of God's word. Love, the, love your neighbor. Do good to them. Give somebody the other cheek. It's hard. It's hard sometimes. But that's the way of the elect. Another type of psalm is the wisdom psalm. Psalms 1 and Psalms 37, which reflects... Themes from the wisdom books of Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Songs of Solomon. 
So they have psalms of wisdom in a poem, format, or a song format. Wisdom. Notice again, you'll see as I go along, that, that Israel wasn't drawing. They weren't drawing from nothing. They were drawing from the prophets. They were drawing, and we'll get down later, drawing from Moses, the lawgiver. They were drawing from their father Abraham. So they weren't just, like some of us do, just make up stories. No, no, they, they, their assurance comes because they heard what God told their fathers. They heard what the prophet Isaiah said. They heard what Ezekiel said. Y'all ain't saying nothing. They, they, they were drawing. Somebody said draw. The, the confidence came because they were drawing from, you see, because they were united as a people. So they drew from the prophet. And the psalmist is singing some wisdom because wisdom was given because the people of God were, oh my God, the people of God. David had written, this one I'd written. They were drawing from it. They drew their strength from the fathers who got their strength from God. That's why you can't have leaders in the church. You can't have a, a bunch of knucklehead leaders. And that's why we have a bunch of knucklehead leaders. Nobody can draw nothing from them. The only thing they, they lead is lead you in taking your money. Some knucklehead leader that God can't use. It said, I'm going to get rid of those pastors, God says. I'm going to put pastors after my own heart. Knucklehead, some knuckleheads say they're leading people. Don't lead them in the way of God. When, you, when you're leading people, people have to be able to draw from you. People have to be able to draw from you. Draw from. As I draw from God, they're drawing from me. Not only are they drawing from the word, they got to draw from my life. Because your life has to be a living testimony that the power of God is at work. I'm not going to change. People are waiting for me to get older so I can change. I'm going to get worse when I get older. I'm going to be even more holy. So just pack up now. Because I ain't never going to change. I'm going to tell you what God says. I'm going to give you the wisdom of God. I'm going to draw from the well of salvation. And I'm going to put it on. I'm going to say, drink. It's up to you to drink or not. I'm going to type of some of the songs of confidence, which enables worshiper to deepen their trust in God while they're going through some tough circumstances. Psalms 22. Draw from that. And that's what we lack most is confidence. One of the, one of the greatest deficits in our spirits is, this, is confidence. We, we put on a, a, a mask of confidence, but we lack confidence. Just let you have a call for multiple days. I ain't going no further than that. Let your call last for a week. You start worrying. Let, let, let the situation get start stinking. Let there be a judgment rendered. You have no confidence. And I'm not talking about confidence in you because if you have confidence in yourself, it's a waste of time. You have no confidence in the one who can turn around your situation. We, we don't have confidence in God. I know, I know, I know. You know, preachers are changing their tone now, so, you know, because people think that when the preacher preach hard, it, it, it kills our confidence. Well, if you can't handle the hard preaching of a preacher, how are you going to handle the fiery darts of the devil? You just got to have so much confidence in God. And confidence in God comes through relationship. Because I can't have confidence in, in something or someone that I don't know and or trust. Well, you can't tr know God 
to trust God if you have no relationship with God. So you need to have a relationship with him. And do your true, your difficult time, he will show up. There's nothing like a friend who stands beside you through your difficult time. You're going through difficult times and your friend is here. There's nothing like having Jesus with you. And he's not going to take you out of the fire, to three Hebrew boys. He's going to go up in the fire with you. And then he'll take away the sting and the burn and the, and the consuming power of the fire. You see, I don't mind going through as long as he is with me. I can deal with it if I know he's there. What I can deal with it is if I know he's not there. I know he's not there. You know, some people can speak tongues when, they, when nobody's around. But then you ain't got no tongues. People around because, you know, they might think I'm faking it. I don't know where that came from. That just came up. God wants me to talk to somebody about that. It wasn't in my mind. Some people are, are acting godly or doing godly things or whatever behind the scenes with people who can't condemn or look at them or question them. But when in the presence of the saints, they're dead. Not that they don't have the spirit of God, they have no confidence. God is with them. Confidence in God. And I just use that as an example, but they have no they have no confidence in God. Sometimes God may say to you, go and pray for Sister Marcia, but because you have no confidence in God. You let others and their words cripple you. Because you don't know in whom you believe. You have no confidence, Lord. Am I, am I talking? Am I making sense? Yeah, you, you have no confidence in God. So, so people who are supposed to be filled with the Spirit of God, who are supposed to be in position to help somebody, they can't go because I'm afraid of what people are going to say. Now, are you serving man or are you serving God? He said, well, maybe, maybe it's me. Well, if it's you, at least get the rebuke and go and sit down. <laughs> at least you made an attempt. Then you know. You know, when I, when I first came up, came up in God and, Lord, I was on fire. Still, I mean, more burned up, but I'm more seasoned. Why? When I first stopped, man, my God. Lord, it is moving. Rah! I jump like a lion. Oh, I go flying. You know, and, and then the mothers would just kind of sit down and just like, you know, call me. Down. Settle down. <laughs> Settle down. They would just calm me down. You know, but the mothers were good. They would pull you aside and just calm me down. Calm me down. Sometimes the bishops are leave him alone. Let him do his thing. You know? And I'll be on my knees walking through the church. Y'all ain't seen nothing yet. God, calm me down with y'all. I'll be on my knees moving through the whole church faster than a leopard. Leave him alone. But some of us ain't doing nothing. So we're afraid of what people say. But I, I didn't care and I still don't care what anybody says. When God said move... Gone. Now, if I pull you aside and deal with you a little bit, don't get upset. And that's my job. I watch everything. So I said, when you had a little pain happen to you yesterday, ain't nobody knew. 
I felt it. You know what I'm saying? And did I not move? I didn't say, oh, Sister Marsh is having pain. And, and you know what? I don't know. I don't know. Saints, come on. Yeah. No, I, the Lord said, go. I'm gone. Maybe I could have gone through. I said, I'm good. I'd be like, Lord, I'm shame right now. But at least I would have moved. Because I hear in God. Before I move, you first have to know that you know what, what the voice of God. You have to have a relationship with God. And when God moves you, you got to move. Listen, I, I, I have so much confidence in God. That I can, I can, I can say to somebody who's sick, be well. I, I have so much confidence in God. That I could come here and I could prophesy. And you watch it come to pass. I have so, I have so much confidence in God. That when somebody's sick, I said, you're, you're not sick anymore. You're, you're healed. How fast were you healed? How fast were you healed? I didn't say shake it. How fast were you healed? Not because of me, but it's my confidence in God. Just the confidence. And children of God, you have to have the confidence. You are God's eyes. You are his hands. You are, you, are, you are who he need and what he needs to get the job done. you got to have confidence. You can't serve God all your days of your life and die never having confidence. And your whole walk would have been in vain. you got to have confidence. You're on the job, Sister Denise, and the kids are acting up. You gotta lay your hand and believe God. You're afraid? Don't you know how famous I am in our board for that? Didn't you hear? Have you not heard? Oh, yes. I'm famous in my board for that. The kids out of line? In the name of Jesus. I'm famous in our board for that. They know the preacher is, oh, they know the preacher, man. Oh, yeah. I, put, I lay my hands on them kids. In the name of Jesus. When the adults get out of line, in the name of Jesus. If you swear too much, I might put my hand on your mouth. And, in the name. I'm not, I have so much confidence in God. You got to have confidence in him. This journey is useless if you have no confidence. This whole walk is futile if you have no confidence. You can't do what God wants you to do if you have no confidence. When you see the lion, you're going to start peeing and pooing yourself. Imagine Daniel saw about 15 lions up in there. You start peeing and pooing. <laughs> right away, you start peeing and pooing. A lot of people can act like they're so tough. You know me, I don't care. I'm going to you know, get a lion and bring him here. I remember we had a situation in here. We had a situation in here, Lord. Some of you act so tough, like you're so holy. We had a situation in WLA. A young lady had a demon possession, and everybody ran out the back door. I, I saw you. I still look at that tape every now and then. I go back and look at the film. You can't tell me nothing. I have it on film. I know all who ran. Every now and then I go back and say, yeah, look at them. Make all this noise in church. Yeah, you remember Brother Ryan? She, this, that girl had Brother Ryan by the tie choking him oh, with, her, with her teeth. And people, <laughs> people are like, I'm out of here. Every now and then. And we had no choice. We had to run and dive up in there. I, I saw me run chasing after the possessed one. Diving right away you are. Head first diving. Said, nah, devil, you got to come out. And the, 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 the demon grabbed the Bible and shot it at me. I don't remember nothing. Oh, yeah. Threw the Bible. You, you were here then, brother? 
threw the Bible at me. I said, no, in the name of Jesus. Why am I always chasing down these demon-possessed people? Everywhere we go, we're chasing them. Chasing, come in. We're chasing and diving. He said, come out in the name. Now, normal people get scared. Because you can act like you're holy or act like you're so powerful. But when, the, when you're put to the test, when you're put to the test, Another type of psalm is, 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 a, is a royal psalm which, which presents the Davidic monarch as the vehicle of blessing for God's people. Psalms 20 and some of thanksgiving is a royal, these are royal praise. And God's David monarch and royalty as, as, as vehicle of God's blessing. That type of psalm. There's another historical psalm which would take lesson from the history of God's dealing with his people, Psalm 78. There's prophetic hymns which echo the prophets calling uh, calling people to covenant faithfulness, Psalms 89. So there, there are different kind of different kind of psalms. I want to kind of Slow down even more now because I want to talk about structure. The Bible said, let everything be done decently and in order. But the Psalms in, in its presentation is not random. It's actually structured. It is in order. It's actually in five books, categorized in five books. The Psalms have five separate books. And it's maybe, and I'm and I'm sure it's it's a a derivative, and the reason why they did it in five types of book is because the Torah were the far first five books, and so the by five books of what they call the Bible, it, it, you know, so they kind of mirrored that kind of approach. Like the Torah, the, the Septuagint in its translation, uh, the Pentateuch, it, it, those first five, the first five books, the Pentateuch within the Septuagint, First five book of the Torah. So they kind of did it in the same kind of manner. So the first book, book one, is, is Psalm, from Psalms 1 to Psalms 41. That's book one. Psalms 1 and 2 provides an intro to Psalms as a whole. Um, and, and, and besides that, what you have, you have the rest of the Psalms as, the, as book one as as the first book, and you have the intro to it, but but you find after you've gone through Psalms one and Psalms two that the rest of this first book were mostly a a cry or a prayer to God of distress. The first book is really a book of distress. So Psalms one to forty one, it's about I'm in distress. I need you, God, to be. Others are statements of confidence in God. Not every single one are, but some of the books have uh, statements of confidence in God who alone can save them. So we're looking at Psalms 9, 11, 16, and 18. Are the exceptions to the lamentations or the cry of distress. These other Psalms were, you know, they're confident in God. And, and it, 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 this whole conflation of, of feelings. There's l people lamenting, but at the same time, in the same breath, you have confidence. And, and sometimes you're lamenting because the situation has gone this long, this far, this deep, so painful. How could you let this go? Yet I believe you'll come through. So sometimes you're going through some things. You don't have to worry. I know you whine and complain to God, but do it to God. I'd rather you cry to God, tell God, where are you? Be like Job, I'm searching for you, left and the right, and I can't find you. I don't deserve this, so on and so forth. But never, ever, ever, in all of your cry, believe that God is not going to come through at some point. He's going to come through. He, come on, encourage yourself tonight. He, he will come through. 
It, he has, and that's why David, I, I, that when he said, I've never, and in his whole life, he said, I've never seen nor have you heard. Because he's, he was speaking from a historic, historical perspective as well, because he has never heard of it. Nor has he ever seen God called the righteous, that means one who is obedient. One who is obedient to God's instruction. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen him forsaken and his seed begging bread. That, that the, the, the wife of the sons of the prophet, her sons were about to be sold. And the man of God showed up. And, and, and when the man of God showed up, she said, my husband served the Lord and he died. In other words, my husband gave his life to God and I got nothing in return. We we're begging bread. The man of God said, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. She, 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 and I told you this, she, she, she could not receive it because she could not perceive it. And you cannot receive anything from God if you first cannot perceive it. No matter how difficult or how hard your situation is, you got to perceive that at any point God is going to. And if you can perceive it, you can receive it. Come on, encourage yourself. The second book, book two, is from Psalms 42 to four, Psalms 72. Book two introduces the first group of Psalms by the sons of Korah. This is where the sons of Korah come in. Let me back up a bit. The first book is all, if mostly, if not all, written by David. So the first book is written by David altogether. All of it, maybe the, to the exception of one or two. The second book introduces the sons of Korah. And then some more of David's psalms. So Korah came in at 42 to 49 and 50. And then David came back again at 51 to 65. And then 68 to 69. David wrote most of the psalms. You have the introduction of of other writers that are coming. The sons of Korah came in. Once again, this second book is about lamenting and the distress that dominate the people of God. The prayers were laden with cry of distress. They lamented over distress. It would seem like, why would God allow this? But as I told you last time, Distress is a part of growth. And, and, and the psalmist is crying, but he's not only crying for himself, there's a communal voice as well. So, so as I told you last week, some of the cry you hear is not only individual, it's, it's, it's communal. That means that the writer writes on behalf of the community. The writer praises on behalf of the community and on behalf of so, so there's a cry here, lamenting and crying, and it's it's individual and it's and it's communal. <clears throat> Psalms 44, Psalm 67, 68. And then and then and then in it, there's a psalm that just came in. Solomon came in. And then Solomon starts in his Psalms, he presented the ideal situation for Israel's king. How a king should carry him. And so the, the composer, whoever it is, maybe it's the Deuteronomistic historiographer, he, he, it's put together so well. Because in your distress, Solomon came in with a psalm, and the psalm is saying, this is how a king should be. Speaking to how Christ is. Type and shadow, we look at it from a Christological perspective. But, but the way it's structured, there's always a voice of reason. This is how the king should be. In a time of struggle, the king should cry to God. Help for the people. We jump down to book three, which is Psalm 73 to 89. And you think it would get better. But a tone of darkness further manifested in book three. It opened with Psalm 73. Uh, and, and, it's, and in Psalm 73, it's powerful because it it's, it's, it's it's questions 
the justice of God, it questions if God is really just. And then in the end, it sees the light of God's presence. So you can get to a place where you question the justice of God. And if you notice the vacillation of emotions that you go through, the psalmist are going through, and, and, and what the psalmist is saying is that as a child of God, you're going to have these vacillations. You're going to have times when you question the justice of God. You're going to have time you wonder, is this right? Did God allow these people to do this thing to me? Hmm? Oh, Jesus. And, 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 and you thought it would get better now after... After 73, but then you get to 88, you realize that this wonderful light that sprung up in 73, the psalmist almost lost the light in 88. Because it's such a bleak psalm. But then it ends again with God showing up again. So it's this whole theme of where are you, God? Oh, there you are. Where are you, God? Oh, here you are. <laughs> You know, so God, so this whole vacillation begins. And then, then, not only that, then there's a sharp ray of hope occasionally pierce the darkness. 75, 80, 579. And then, Korah comes in and Asa comes in. Start manifesting. Other people start talking about God. Different Voices started to talk about the goodness of God. Book four is from Psalms 90 to 106. And then Psalms 90 answers the previous problem from book three. Because book three, there's still some concerns, some dark and some worry that God it's not showing up. And then all of a sudden, Psalms 90 introduces Moses' voice. And Moses' voice gets up and started to say, listen, worshipers. God is actively working on your behalf. God has not forsaken you. The voice of Moses is now in Psalms 90 saying, listen, listen. I know you're struggling. I know you, you are not. You think God has abandoned you. God has not abandoned you. Remember, he took you through the wilderness. He never left you. He's always by your side. Talk to me a little. Yeah, he's always there for you. The Lord reigns. Say he reigns. Get down to these things and people are moaning and whining but he reigns and his truth will always destroy the darkness he reigns somebody say he reigns then we get to the last book is book five book five is from 107 to 190 and the structure of book five reflects the closing petition of book four 106 47, it declares that God does not answer prayer, 7, and concludes, sorry, that God does answer prayer, that he does answer prayer, and concludes with five hallelujah psalms, I like that, 146 to 150, hallelujah psalms, it's hallelujah, God answers prayers, the distress of book, the end of book 4, book 5 answers book 4, in one of, and say, God Answer prayer. 106.47 said, where is God? A distress for God. Psalms 106.47 has this bleak look. But then they're rejoicing at the end of the book saying, God answered prayer. Hallelujah. Praises start shouting out. Hmm? Promises of God 
are validated. David is seen again, talking about how great God is. So the whole book of Psalms, all these five books, is this vacillation of lamentation and rejoicing and, and the history of God. And, and, and these books are, are, are not books you go to. And notice something. It, it's, these are, as I said last week, these are not prophetic books. These are books where the writers are speaking. If you see prophetic themes, they're saying what they heard from the prophets. The drawing from the prophets. The drawing from the prophets. And what they draw from the prophets are the assurance. The assurances. So you're hearing them write and say, oh, that's prophetic. But they're really drawing from the prophet of history. And the prophets of old. And so they're drawing in and they write. These, remember, their songs, their prayers, their hymns, their poems, their history. And they're, and, and they're writing about the victory that Israel had and what God did and what is, and God is doing and what God is about to do. And it comes from the idea that, that God has elected Israel. Can't stand studying. They want to hear Bible study, but they, you, you want me to scream and shout. You can't learn nothing from that. Start teaching and your mouth start opening and you sleep in the church. You gotta come to learn. So you don't go back and make the same mistakes and go in the south. And this is the prophecy. And, and you saw the New Testament writer said, and David, who was a prophet, but David, when you ask David, they would tell you that I ain't no prophet. David wasn't writing about, David had no idea that he was a prophet. But it was God using his words in a prophetic way. I hear what I'm saying. So you got to know, we got to understand these books and what they're about. All right. Speaking of understanding, we have to, we have to be able to, to understand the strategies of Scripture. Here's a question, and I, and I wrote it here. I said, what should we do with the Psalms? Now that you know the history somewhat of it, what do you, it's Israel's issues. It was their election. It was their struggles and lamentation, their revelation, their struggle. What do we do with it today? Because sometimes you're acting like you're a Jew. But you're not a Jew. And black people aren't Jewish. Everybody want to take the Bible and say, oh, we're the real Jews. No, you're not. Israel is Israel. Gentiles are Gentiles. The church is the church. Church contains everybody. So I'm in the church. I'm not a Jew. I want to declare that because a lot of people have problems. A lot of people have come with different doctrines. That's a false doctrine. You're not Jewish. You're not Israel. You are the church. What do we do with it? Should, 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 should we study the Psalms for instruction? Should we extrapolate the history from it? What do we do with it? Should we use it to teach us how to pray? Should we sing the Psalms? Because we're singing somebody else's experiences. I can't sing your experience. I can't sing your experience. Should I, should I, what should I do with it? The Bible never told us what to do with it. The Bible never said what you should do with it. The Bible said in Hebrews that we have a cloud of witnesses. So what, what should we do with it? Well, I, I'll say that we should use it as an inspiration. Hello, somebody. We, we should use it as an inspiration 
to teach us how we should worship in the face of troubles and trials. Uh, I, I say we should use it as an inspiration to tell me and uh, to keep me abreast to, to, to the knowledge that God has always been there for his people and God will always be there for his people. It doesn't matter what my situation is. God is always there. I should use it as an inspiration. Hello? I, 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 I should use it as a material that I study so that I may understand how people ought to function who are the elect of God. Somebody say a cloud of witnesses. I should use the Psalms and I should look at it and I, I should see from it how David function, how Israel function when they are facing some situations. I should use it as an example of how I should be with respect to contemporary times and my contemporary situations. I mean, I don't go into Psalms and start quoting David's words. I know all, all, all the God, religious Christians will be mad at this. Because they want to get up in it and start quoting. And David said, and they're quoting, and you're going on and you're quoting and you're quoting. But I, I what I need from the Psalms, I need an example. I need to know how I should live, how I should function, how I should praise, how I should endure. How I should be thankful. How that I can throw my every cares on the Lord and he's not going to kill me for doing that. that. That's what I need to extrapolate from it. I need a weakness. I need some support. So I go to David's word and I, some of you are David. You are pseudo David. They call it, in theology, pseudopigrapha. You're writing in the name of somebody else. But this is, you're acting like you're somebody else. I, I, I can see how God functioned with Israel. How God functioned with David. And know that he's the same God yesterday. And the same. Call your name and say, Andrew, you're going to be holy. Call your name. Say it again. Say it again. You're going to be holy. You're not going to be a fake. You're not going to be somebody else. I've known too many preachers who say they're a Paul and end up being converted by the enemy. I preach with people who have been robbed and completely bamboozled by the devil. Because they want to be something you see in the character. God don't want you to be David. Or you would have made you David. God don't want you to be Paul. Or you would have made you Paul. Paul said follow me as I followed Christ. He said I Paul can do nothing of myself. It is the Christ that does it. He dwells in me. I've never heard Peter act like Paul. And Paul act like Bartholomew. Every man to himself. You have your own trials. You got your own circumstance. But one thing you got from them, you know God is real. You know God is a deliverer. God is a healer. You know that God is a buckler. You know that he's going to show up. couple more minutes. I got to deal with this. I want to deal with this thing called Sila. Found in the 39th Psalm. Sila. I want to deal with it. I want to deal with it quickly because I got to kill this misnomer. We said Sila means stop and reflect. 
But that's not what Selah means. Selah doesn't mean stop and reflect. You said that. There's nowhere in history that it says stop and reflect. It's a song. You don't stop and reflect in a song. The composer of the music who's writing the song I was sharing with Nicole and Gary yesterday and whoever was listening. I said Gary because I you know, wanted to say I'm sharing with her yesterday. I said, listen, you got to understand something. When the musician is writing the music, he has a break. It's called a what? An interlude. And the break is to take the song in a different direction. It's called a speaker's pause. The speaker's pause is not to so much to reflect. It's so to give you to take you in the direction he wants you to take you. So when the musician is playing, you think they stop for you to think about what they are playing? So, so Psalms is a song, a poem, a prayer. Do you stop when you pray so somebody else can reflect on what you're praying about? When you're singing, do you stop and says, church, stop and reflect. Let's go to the next verse. No, it makes no sense. An interlude. It takes you somewhere else. When there's a sailor, it means he wants to take you somewhere else. Something more important. Somewhere deeper. Take it to another level. Well, sailor is not about reflecting of what was said. But we're going to another level. We're going to something deeper. Something more meaningful. It's not what was, it's what's coming. Somebody asked me, how is it that you get, how is it that you get so much word? Because I don't stop and reflect on the last word. I go to the next word. Because what God has to say is something deeper. While I was getting the previous word, I was in it with God. When I'm done, he takes me to another level. And that's what the songs are about. When you listen, you read. Have you, listen, I've never read, I have in this two master's degree. And I've never, never, Brother Gary, never been read, never read one of those thick, crazy books. And stop to reflect over everything. Go back. I got to go forward to hear what the book is saying. I've written. I've been writing and reading. Lord. Almost nuts. Almost crazy. With all these much learning made oh, make me mad. But I've never saw an interlude and stop and forget the rest. No, God is a God of going forward. The reason why the young man died on the way, because God said go forward. He's stopping for a break and he's looking back. And God said, don't what? Go back. You've got to go forward. The, the, the sailor is about going forward. You're looking at an interpretation that, 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 is, that is what we call late antiquity. You're looking at an interpretation that's late. You're looking at something that's recent. And so the fathers have drilled us in our heads. And now we, you hear me saying this and you can't even believe it. I know it. I'm feeling it. Yeah, you're having trouble because you're not ready to go higher. You're not ready to go deeper. You're happy with where you came. I'm happy. I'm ready to die here. Goodbye. God don't stop you. As a matter of fact, look at the, the journey from Egypt to the promised land. There ain't no looking back. You 
got to go forward. When you stop, you stop for a drink. And a stop for a revelation. But you got to go forward. The musician told me yesterday, I thought I was mad. I was upset. I'm mad because when I came to you, I told you about this break in the song. In the song, I tell you, and I asked the musician, I said, how do you do it? What did you say? You responded by saying, yeah, you transition, you transition. Now, there's also another thought, and I know it's a late, uh, uh, a late thought as well. The sailor also could be speaking about a congregational response. At a certain point when Yet that Selah, the people responded. Or the people had a part to say. Move on. The people had a part to say and then you move on. It could be a congregational response as well. But it's not about this whole stopping and reflecting. It sounds good and it preaches very well. But we're looking at the reality of what the translation and the transliteration is. It's about, literally about breaking to go higher. So you break to go higher. When you see Sila, saying go higher. It's a break. Huh? A transition. An interlude to go in a different direction or higher. All right? That's all I'm going to say about that. I'm going to say one more thing that I'm done. I want to talk about David in my closing. I want to say David, David wasn't an ordinary king. David was a warrior king. And, and he was to be endowed by God to govern his people with God-like righteousness to deliver, press, defend the defenseless, suppress the wicked, bless the nation, Bring peace and prosperity to them. God chose David for that purpose. David was an intercessor. He was a builder. He was a maintainer. Psalms 1 and David, David, his life became a reflection of what the Messiah would do. God used David in such a magnanimous way that when you see David's life, you get a reflection. David also had a promise from God that out of his seed would a king sit perpetually. So, But the, it was the life of David that God used to speak to what he would do as the king of kings, the earth and the Lord of lords. It was the life of David, the warrior king. David was not gentle David was a chosen servant of God for the people he was not a gentle man but he was a man after God's own heart David was by no means Solomon Solomon couldn't even carry his cape when you're talking about a king, you're talking about David. There's none like him. This was God's choice. This was, you want to know how Jesus was? Look at the life of David. That's who we reflect. And the reason why David is the writer that almost wrote 75% 75, 75 or more of the Psalms. God chose his writing, his life. Solomon wrote many, but he wasn't in the Psalms. He has his own wisdom books. But God chose this man, this man, David. This is who exemplifies me. And if you want to know how you should be, this is one you should look at his life. Look at how he functions with respect to God. Look at how he honors God. Look at how he deals with the things of God. Look at how he deals with adversities. 
Yes, he cried. Yes, he moaned. Yes, he hates with perfect hatred. Yes, he did. But yet he understood that though Saul was evil and needed to be eradicated, that he had no right to violate. difference with David and you and me is that David said I hate somebody with a perfect hatred but we lie we act like we don't hate but I'd rather David's hatred than yours David confesses his that's man that's who God wants you're gonna have times when you feel like hating somebody you're gonna have time when you do hate somebody but you're gonna come to God and say Lord I hate that girl with a perfect hatred. And God said, you're wrong. You can't do that. You can't do that. Change that. Get rid of that. That's not right. We know God loves it. He loves it because you're honest with him. Oh, I wish I had. You're honest with him. So God said, this man, look at David, I want to show you some of my life, my last one, I got to go. But, but David, 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 Jebusi and David made it the city of God. <laughs> he took a city and he said, this is a city of God, I'm going to build God's temple here. And, and, and it's called the city of God, Mount Zion. It's all from David. He said, I'm going to do for God. I'm going to build God's house. I'm going to honor God. I'm going to sacrifice unto God. I'm going to dance unto God. I don't care if my wife is upset. I'm going to dance unto God. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to do the right thing unto God. That's the kind of person that God is looking for. He's looking for somebody with character. Not a selfish and pompous character. He's looking for somebody with a godly character. God said, I'm so mad. You don't know what I wish. God said, look, I'm so upset, I'm going to kill everything. You don't even know who God is. God said, I've had it with men. The stench has come up to me. I'm going to kill everything. And then God said, I repent. <laughs> repent of the evil I thought to do. Huh? David had that same kind of characteristic. You know, you start thinking some things. Come on, talk to me. That, that's why he said this man kind of, this man kind of have the attributes of God. This is a man I'm gonna make king. This is a man I'm gonna put in the throne. This is a man. He's hungry and he walk up in the house of God. And some of you self righteous people would have never let him in, but he would have chopped your head off. He would have walked in and took, taken the shoe bread. And kill Abiatar if he didn't give it to him. But Abiatar knew who David was. Abiatar said, y'all come on. But some of you men better all lose sleep with little girls out there can't eat now. You got to be clean for what? A few days. Sanctify yourself. Come on, eat this shoe bread. And Jesus quoted it. Did you not see David when he was a hunger, how he went up in the house of God and ate the shoe bread? You understand what I'm saying? It's a man after God's own heart. Did things right. One man criticizing him. Oh, miserable. The neighbor. Huh? And David said, I'm down here taking care of your sheep. I'm protecting your men and your sheep. And this is how, that's how some church people are. You preach the devil out of them and they don't care about you. David said, yeah, I'm going to take it. <laughs> David said, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, all right. I'm down here working hard and you think the, the preacher's going to preach to you. And you, you yeah. Paul said, Paul picked it up and said, I can take of your money. your money to 
the money to foolish things. I can take it. My right. And David said, yeah, I'm coming for it. I said, so when I come, I'm killing everything that pisses against the wall. This Pharisee over here telling me, cut down generation. He said, piss it against the wall. I'm going to kill every male. And you're, you're done. You're finished. Your generation is cut off. Are you know what I'm saying? And he was getting ready. Come on, boys, let's go. And God's like, I'm with you. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All the land. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing, not sleeping. David is an example of how the church should be. He's a type and shadow of the church. You want to know how to be in the church? Look at this man's life. He has praise up in there. He has sacrifice up in there. He got some crying up in there. He has deliverance up in there. He has some killing up in there. You got to kill some devils in your life. You got to kill some things in your life. You got to kill some things. You got to kill some things in your life. And the thing that hinder you, you got to kill it. Come on, say, I've got to kill some things in my life. You got to kill some nasty spirits. something. I'm done now. We gotta kill something. This man was, Lord, I can't let it go. This man was so special. Why did he didn't rain? And the people imagine a vain thing. He said a vain thing. How dare you think you can touch God's anointed? How dare you? He that said it in the heaven laugh. I can't wait to touch these psalms. The devil's going to come out of us. That God sit in the heaven laughing. Pull out his sword. He think God is a little soapbox. He's a warrior. God is a warrior. He's a warrior king. Listen, my calling and your calling may be different. You got the soft soap one. He got the killing one. I got the killing anointing. You might have the soft one. Oh, no, honey. I got to I gotta kill some devils. I've got to kill some spirits. Why do the people? Do the heathen red and the people imagine a vain thing? Against the Lord. Against his Christ. The word Christ there is Messiah, his Savior. You thought he's talking about Jesus. No, David was talking, talking about the king. Talking about himself. He's not talking about Jesus. He don't know Jesus. You tell David about Jesus, he don't know who Jesus is. He's never heard the name. It was in David. It was in his loins. In other words, he's saying, how do people rise up against me? Y'all ain't. That's why I'm telling you, listen, if you ain't holy by the end of the year, you ain't never going to be holy again. You're never going to be holy again. I prophesied. If you don't give yourself to holiness, you're never going to see 2020. 20, 20, you'll never be holy again. You gotta, God is making 2019 the year of holiness. Turning bread into blessings. And this is the year we got to be holy. This is the year you got to talk to God. When I preach this word, you go on your knees. The lady came here the other day, and I went down, and I spoke to her from Jamaica. She came here, and she came, and she's of a different persuasion. And the Lord I sent me there, I spoke to her. And the lady went home, and when she went home, she came back Sunday, next Sunday. She was troubled. She said, she's troubled. I said, I went to talk to her. What's wrong? She said, I went to my vision. I sleep, and I saw you in a vision, and you were just staring at me. As I told her, go ask God if what I tell you is true. She went and asked God. When she prayed, I went to bed. She said, Look, I just stood there watching her. She was afraid. Go ask God if this is true. Go ask.
trust God if his word is not true. God has called us to a higher plane. God wants warriors. God wants truthful warriors with a pure heart. Not Listen, the old Christian of what you used to do is dead. It's time now for a change. It's time to be radical. It's a radical time. We're in a radical world. We have gender fluidity. We have all kinds of stuff going on. And the church is sitting there like a bunch of dead skeletons. Who will lead the people? He said, not me because I'm, I, I don't have the words. And you're going to get passed by. And God is going to pick somebody out. Who said, Lord, I, I ain't got it, but use me if you want to. Use me if I, if I got something to offer. The whole way of doing things is this. You just come to church and clap your hands. Hallelujah. That, that ain't going, no, you ain't doing nothing. There ain't nothing happening with you. Clap your hand and you go, Hallelujah. What is that? How is that righteousness? How, how is that doing the will of God? How is that? How? Talk to me. Rebuke me, somebody. Rebuke me if I'm wrong. Every week you come and clap your hands and say you're going to heaven. Listen, he that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in what have you overcome? You didn't overcome anything because you have not put yourself in the position to do the will of God. Ah, but you want comfort. You want what you want. You have your own, you have your own desires. You want to do what you want to do. And you expect God to do it for you because you clap your hands. That's not how God works. He doesn't work like that. He's looking for a willing soul. He's looking for someone to say, here I am, Lord. He's looking for another David with a personal relationship with him. Yeah, I'm done with this last statement. He said, he said, brother, he said, Saul, Saul, you're done. He said, he said, I got a man. That's somebody. I have chosen, I handpicked him. He's not of royal blood. He's not a, he doesn't have a name behind him. As a matter of fact, he's not even the first choice in his own family. He's not, I don't know if he could, he had good letters. I don't know if he could read well. Because he, he tended the sheep all day long. I don't know. I don't know. How he looked, how he smelled. He certainly wasn't smelling good. Always at work, nails might have been black. He's a man with Character. Character. You can't serve God. You can't serve God without character. Character. Come out of your shells now. It's time to talk to God. It's time to be holy. It's time to be holy. It's time to be holy. Come on, raise your hand before I. Give over this mic. Let's lift up your hand while you're seated. In your own words, in your own way. Tell God I hear you and I'm ready for your instructions, Lord. As we go through this book of Psalms, tell God, Lord, teach me thy way. Teach me how to deal with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I don't want to be David. I don't want to be, and I always want to be, I want to be who you made me to be. But I want to learn from the cloud of witnesses. I want to learn how I should be. I want to learn how I should speak, how I should act, how I should think, how I should walk, how I should talk, how I should dress. I want to learn. I want to learn how to be holy. I want to learn how to be holy. I want to learn. I want to learn. I want to learn. I want to learn how to be holy. Thank you, 
you, Jesus. Let us stand as we close. We've heard the word tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. This is a serious, serious season that we're living in. And God is sending his word to teach us how to be holy. We can't take it for granted at all. And as we heard tonight that David was a good example, hallelujah, of how the church should be and of how we should be as children of God. We really have to take heed to these words and apply them to our lives. Hallelujah. In Psalm 119, David said, you know, when I have respect unto thy precepts, you know, and that speaks to, as the man of God said tonight, applying the words, knowing what God wants, knowing what God loves, no matter if we're found guilty, no matter if it hurts, but we have to have respect unto the word of God and apply it to our lives if we want to see changes. Amen. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, great King and great God, Lord Jesus Christ, we come tonight, Lord. Oh God Almighty, with our hearts lifted up to you, Jesus. Oh God, we pray, Jesus, that you take our hearts, Lord. Oh God Almighty, though they may be stony, oh God, they may be tough, hard, rocky, oh Lord Jesus Christ. But tonight, Lord, we pray that you give us a heart of flesh, Lord Jesus Christ, that we may receive your word, Lord, that, oh God Almighty, we may change, Lord Jesus, for God, we must change daily we realize lord that oh god we have sinned and come short but lord jesus you always send a word lord jesus christ that we may change oh god so that in the end we may look like you jesus i pray god give us oh god almighty a spirit lord jesus oh god that we don't puff ourselves up lord jesus that we don't rebel against your word but jesus help us Lord, to be as a little child. Oh God Almighty, give us, Lord Jesus, that heart. Oh God, just like how David was. Even when David sinned, Lord. Oh God, he said, Lord, I have sinned against thee. And against thee alone have I sinned and done this wicked thing. Lord Jesus, teach us. Oh God Almighty, I pray thee. Remember, Lord Jesus, the apostle, Andrew Henry, Lord. Oh God, he has poured out out of his soul. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray, God, that you continue to use him, Lord, in this season which you have called him, Lord. Continue, oh God, to pour into his vessel, oh God Almighty, that he may pour out, oh God, upon us, Lord Jesus, that we may be edified. Father, we thank you for him. Jesus, oh God, we thank you, oh God Almighty, that he has yielded himself, oh God, to hear words from you. Lord Jesus Christ, touch him, Lord. Touch his family. Oh, God, continue, Lord, to bless them. Oh, God, indeed, Lord Jesus, we thank you. We bless your holy name, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, go with us as we're about to leave this place. Lord Jesus Christ, until we meet again. Father, cover us, Lord. Oh, God Almighty, protect everyone as we head home, Lord Jesus. Bind up every accident, demon. In the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, God Almighty, let somebody pray tonight when they go home and ask the Lord, Jesus Christ, let someone ask you, Lord, if this word is true. Confirm your word, Jesus. Show yourself strong and mighty. In no other name we pray, but in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight O lord our strength and our redeemer no retreat no retreat no retreat amen amen greet someone in jesus name oh.